um, Sababu, who is actually the uh, the publisher and the uh, the point man. I know Sababu probably forty something years. Sababu is probably one of the best editors in the business, bar none. This is not exaggeration. This is not hype. It just happens to be the fact and the evidence provides for us is the truth. Sababu is a brilliant brother. He's always been the right hand man to uh, Amos. And um, one thing that you can always bet your dollar is he crosses his eyes and he dots his teeth. And you can tell it in every particular manuscript and every um, text that you get. He's that kind of guy. Um, Dr. William Mackey, wow. Dr. Mackey, you know, I used to tell me, me and Dr. Mackey, we were book people, you know, as you can see in this picture. I mean, I, I, I got a few books, but Dr. Mackey was the man, you know what I mean? You go in and say, I got books in the bathroom, books in the living room, books in the kitchen, books underneath the counter, you know, books we make chairs out of. I mean, Dr. Mackey was, and most of the time I used to see Dr. Mackey either coming or going from strands. I'd be going in, he'd be coming out. He had two or three big bags running down the street, something like that. And I'd say, Dr. Mackey, what you, what you get? he said, oh, man, you know. And he'd say, pick this up, show me this. Because back then, Strands was cheap. You know, we used to go to Strands because it was actually a used bookstore. So you go there, you could book buck, two dollars, fifty cent, and I mean good stuff, really good stuff. They had a real excellent bookstore around the corner from Strands, right on, on, um, on, um, 12th and Broadway, but around the corner and upstairs, it was the old Jewish white boy. Yeah. And how I found out about it was Doc Ben and Dr. Clark and them, when they would come down and we were they would never go. They would say, I'll be right back. And they would go around the corner and go to this guy's house, and they would go upstairs, and Dr. Clark knew him because he used to be with this guy from under London, England, he used to have a store called Blackwell's. And they used to go, when they wanted rare books, that's where they would go. But this guy had all of the books. I mean, they were serious. But um, Dr. Mackey was that kind of guy. Dr. Mackey was one of the brilliant scholars in regard to European history. He knew about European history the way you know about basketball. Mm -hmm. He was just that well read in so many different areas. And second is just that he never would provide you with information that he didn't have references for. He would never give you information like shooting from the hip, like a lot of these people do nowadays. You know, most of, as I was explaining to them, most of the stuff you see on the internet is cut, post, and paste. I mean, or cut, paste, and post, excuse me. That means that they just cut it, it looks nice, it sounds nice, and I'm going to circulate it. They never check it, never find out whether the material is legitimate or not, but yet they are so into what I call the romantic side of history, that um, it's easy for them to circulate misinformation. And as I was explaining to her earlier about this, um, this experience I had where a brother, uh, a prominent brother of a, of a prominent organization in New Jersey put a post on his site, well it was actually on Facebook, based on his site, and he, he put up a picture and said that this was a picture of Nat Turner. So, you know, I mean, first of all, the, the picture amazed me because I knew who the picture was, the picture of was. And then second, he said it was Nat Turner, and, I, you know, there was no photography during Nat Turner's time. So, you know, obviously, you know, one of the key pictures, one of the key features was that the individual who posted the picture must, even though he might have been romantically involved with Nat Turner, he really must have never read the history of the time period, you know. And all of these things mean something. So when we study history, a lot of times, as I was, you know, telling Ray Ray, there are certain things you need to know, rules of etiquette in regard to just reading a the book. There's rules of etiquette when it comes down to reading a book. So when we, I mean, I'm studying the book. Versus when you read it. When you read it, you just go through it and done. But when you study in it, 
there's rules of etiquette that you have to literally have in place in order to get the necessary essence out of the information. And that is, is that you got to know what you're doing. The object is not to read it for entertainment. It's to read it to learn lessons and understand the material in its content. And what happens is, is that we do not do that. So Professor Simmons used to say that you got to have the five rules of etiquette. I want to know who the, the title is. I want to know the author. I want to know the publisher. I want to know when that book was published. And I want to know what bibliography they used. Because that gives you underpinning. It gives you some idea on what that person drew from. And most of all, it gives you an understanding on who you're dealing with. How would you read a book written by an individual and not know the person? So the first thing you want to do when reading a book is you want to be able to first go and look up who the author is. See, years ago, we didn't always have these things at your disposal. As Dr. Lewis know, you used to have a thing called a dust jacket on a book. So when you opened up the book in the front of the dust jacket, it will give you a summary or an interview, I mean an introduction of somewhat what the book is about. But on the flip side, it would give you a small biography and a couple of paragraphs of the author. And then you had access to you know who he was, where he was, and then you can go do further to find out what his education was, whether he was good at what he did, this, that, and the other, so forth and so on. See, we don't realize that when you walk in the doctor's office and you see his diploma hanging on the wall, it don't tell you whether he was an A student or he had. It's just hanging there. And you assume that he qualified because he got a white jacket, a stethoscope on, and he didn't pay. That just happens to be the case. But that's not how we did it. So tonight, what I wanted to do in honor of Black History Month was I want to focus on some of the great personalities. And like Doc Ben and Dr. Clark and I'm Ben Serving, Professor Simmons and Professor Mackey and you know Amos Wilson. Um, these were the individuals that I were around personally that I had access to, that I had the ability to sit at their feet and listen to them bestow, bestow uh, uh, upon us brilliant lessons of life. Brilliant lessons of life. And this particular African History Month, I felt that one, that I would do Chancellor Williams, two, because in our study group, we using that particular book now, but also to give you some insight who this particular personality is and what role he played. When Dr. Ben was writing the books and he would carry that loose leaf notebook, you know, the one with the three rings, the big stack, and he would have these pages and he would, you know, page by page, you know, painting, pressing, writing, and for you, be carrying this thing. So you finish that doc? You finish that doc? And a lot of times you wouldn't know how far he was. And then one day, it would just pop up. It would come out. And one of the things that was always an issue was it was just so saturated with so much information that you just got literally low. It was like getting ready to go in a pool and you thought you was at the, the shallow end and you jumped in the deep end. And you just got literally engulfed. Well, a lot of that was because we had no preparation. We was given raw information and really didn't know how to digest it. And what happened is as time went on, we got to the point where that, you know, our cup runneth over. That means we had so much that gets to a point where that you become so saturated you can't absorb anymore. And for a lot of times, that's what happened. You know, First World went on for quite a while. You know, when it first started, we was using cassettes. <laughs> no jive. And when it ended, you know, I mean, it was video footage. 
I mean, it was just really a, a real deep cultural educational experience, and all of that played a role. But one of the reasons I felt Chancellor um, played such a significant role because there are certain scholars that are very, very uh, academically inclined. What I mean by that is, is that they play such a large role in and with an institution. Whereas there are other scholars who worked outside of that particular arena. Even though they was of that academic experience, like a Doc Ben, he worked more or less outside that particular arena. Where that guys like Chancellor Williams worked inside the arena. Even though they was as fierce in their uh, um, in their attempt to rewrite um, and literally tell our story, our own narrative, they also became these warriors that literally set the foundation that would eventually come later down the road. So right. when we think about Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark, they stand on the shoulders of individuals like Chancellor Williams and John G. Jackson. That's right. And then on John G. Jackson and Chancellor Williams, they stand on the shoulders of individuals who came before them, like Hubert Harrison and Alonzo Schomburg. Right. And then they stand on the shoulders of individuals who came before them, who was one of the, anybody, the most brilliant African scholar that ever lived, that laid the foundation for every one of these individuals, including me, most of y'all never heard of. Harrison? No. no. It was before that. As a matter of fact, this individual fought in the Civil War. And, and I'm going to tell you, this is what I want y'all to do. I'm going to want to Say that again. Benjamin Maddox? No. Delaney? No. And what I want y'all to do, I want y'all to write, I'm, I'm going to tell you his name. I want you to write his name down, and then I want you to go look him up. I'm going to give you a little bit of information, but what's going to happen is when you find out who he is and what he did at the time that he did what he did, it's going to blow you off the Richter scale. His name is George Washington Williams. George Washington Williams. The one who did the black hole? No. That's John Mitchell, Jr. Okay, okay, okay. That's another different, that's another guy, too. But George Washington Williams, write it down, I'm telling you. Don't want to forget it. He a bad, bad brother. Bad brother. And George... This is in uh, 1800s. Well, actually, late 17, late 17, early 18. But you'll find out he goes quite a long way. But the amount of accomplishments that he achieves and what he actually does at the time that he does it, it literally revolutionizes the whole art of research and study. He's one of them kind of guys. There's two guys, when you talk about research and study, that goes far beyond those is people like George Washington Williams and a guy by the name of, um, by the name of Ibn Khaldun. You ever heard of him? Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun was born in North Africa. And um, he's probably one of the most premier, premier, premier scholars in Islamic history and law since the foundation in Africa. And when you read Hadith, he is the yardstick that you measure the quality of truth by. And the only other reference that you have in regard to that is Quran. But Ibn Khaldun is that individual. But there's quite a few other people. I B N Ibn K A H. Uh, let me see K A H. Ooh, no, let me just get it correct so I don't give it to you. Uh, spell it wrong. Excuse me. But um, one of the things about these particular scholars is is the role they played in telling their particular story. Um, is IBN K 
K-H-A-L-D-O-U-N. Say it again. Ibn, I-B-N, which means son of, mm -hmm. Khaldun. K-H-A-L-D-O-U-N. Now that's one scholar. Write this down. This is another. Matter of fact, keep your hands on the pencil. You're going to write down Ibn Battuta. I-B-N, B-A-T-T-U-T-A, Ibn Battuta. E, this one is El Omari, E-L dash O-M-A-R-I. These are all scholars, but they come from the 7th, 8th, and 9th century. Wow and proved that everything that the police said was wrong. Now, this is why I say people got this idea when we talk about truth that is fixed like this wall. No. Mm -mm. And that there is some absolute truth or absolute history, and it's not. It's only based on who's telling the story, how the narrative is being looked at, and are we weighing the evidence based on what the story is being said, what story is being said. So if we have evidence, and the evidence is saying one thing, and then the storyline is saying another, you should be scratching your head saying like, something off here. But that's not what we do. That's exactly not what we do. We go along with the story because everybody else go along with the story. And that's not what history is about. So Chancellor Williams and those kind of guys, they were the first people that decided to challenge the established, you know, um, uh, academic community, and not just him personally, but all of the Africans that from, you know, George Washington Williams and, and even further back, you know, up into modern day time, they was like, what y'all give enough is not enough. And not only is not enough, we don't think that it's all that accurate. Mm -hmm. Slept. So, so most of them decided that they would go and do the research on their own. But what I want to do tonight is, uh, 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 first I'm going to show you about 10 minutes of uh, Chancellor Williams, just to give you an idea, those that don't know him and never seen him, versus those that have seen him and want to hear just a little bit. This is an episode that comes from Tony Brown's journal. It's giving you some insight in regard to, again, just to let you hear him talk and see what he's about. And then after that, I'm going to go into his biography and give you a basic background of who he is and what his biography is. And then we're going to talk about um, some of the issues of uh, scholarship in regard to the uh, material. Now, um, before I start, have anybody be um, seen Chancellor Williams before? Y'all? Yeah, I've seen my Chancellor Williams around the sure. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question. What book came first? Uh, re uh, the Rebirth came first. Is he right? Mm -hmm. He said, I don't know. <laughs> But see, again, this is the issue why I ask you about the date of a book. Most people don't know that. They look at Chancellor and they see that he's a great academician who writes nonfiction, which is not true. Did y'all know that Chancellor Williams wrote more novels than he wrote nonfiction? That's why I say, <laughs> tell me. Well, actually, actually, I think it was a poem. Well, it was and not a poem, but it was a book, but written in a pamphlet form, and then eventually elongated it. It was a it was a book called The Raven, and it was written about a, a bi biographical sketch about Edgar Allan Poe. This is Chancellor Williams, but let's get on. So I'm gonna show you this, and those that uh. This will give you some, uh, 
You spend quite a bit of, uh, of time in your book you know, describing the ancient civilization of Ethiopia. What is it you find important about that civilization? <laughs> well, the ancient civilization of Ethiopia was the, the, the uh, civilization of what we're talking about when we talk about that old stretch of land from the Mediterranean uh, to the source of the Nile which was ancient Ethiopia. So Egypt was nothing but uh, what we call Egypt now, which was Chim. Uh, why is that? Why, why with this advanced African civilization, when they interfaced with, with members of other groups, why did the members of that civilization always end up on the bottom of the ladder? Uh, we have always been, as I uh, repeatedly pointed out, uh, the race of brotherhood seekers. We have been the one who forever have carried on the drive for brotherhood with other people. They have never sought brotherhood with us, never, except for experience, where they saw an opportunity uh, to play the role of big brother for a while, while they uh, uh, gain co effective control. Now, uh, they're cunning. See, they study us, and they, they know this. They have, they have certain basic advantages. They can easily win our confidence, first of all, because Africa, the whole continent of Africa, was known as the land of the religious people. Uh, we, we were always, we didn't start the oldest religion in America and being more religious than the whites. No, this is an African characteristic. Mm -hmm. we, were, uh, we were known from ancient times as the land of the spiritual people, the land of the gods, you know, because we were so religious. The blameless people, homeless road, uh, we, we were so religious. Uh, so this must be kept in kept in mind in this general, general appraisal. How significant was the oral historian in the reconstruction of African history? Well, the oral historian is indispensable if you're going to, uh, if you're going to make a comparative study of history in which you're going to, you're going to compare uh, what had been written, and since it all was written by foreigners, uh, with what the, the Africans themselves had written and the records of their mind and their records and the records of their mind turned out to be <laughs> as, as uh, accurate as uh, unerring in many respects as uh, as uh, what is written in, in, in books <coughs> okay that's just to give you a big idea on Chancellor Williams was what he built it like. While Southern migrants faced the harsh Y'all know who voiced that was? Skip Hayes. You didn't say his name correctly. It's Skip the Tree Hayes. Oh, right. Skip the Tree Hayes. <laughs> Gotta put it correct. Skip the Tree That's, That's my beautiful sister Keisha. <laughs> Skip the Tree Hayes. Now, that gives you at least some insight into, you know, uh, you know, um, what Chancellor Williams looked like, some of his attitude, you know, give you a little brief insight of some of his ideas. Uh, but again, you go on YouTube, that particular um, presentation is available. There's only three actual um, video footages that are actually available. This one, one that was done in 1978, and one that was done in, I think, 81 or something like that. The two other ones beyond this one are very, very poor quality, grainy and everything, but the material is good. Very, very good. There's one interview that is done with a group of brothers. Uh, it's a one-on-one -on -one, um, type of interview, 
but the um, it's in I think eight parts. It's in eight parts, but it's only audio. It got still footage, but it's mainly audio. But it's probably one of the best renditions that I ever heard of him go into detail about a variety of different things. So you would want to go and um, look at that material as reference material to give you some better insight to who he is. What, what year I, was that? Huh? What year was that interview? That interview? That was in the, um, yeah, in the to mid to late 80s, something like that. Uh, I don't know right off the top of my head, but um, you know, I, um, later on I'll give it the information to Ray Ray, and you can get it from me. I guarantee you that. Um, what I want to do now is I'm going to read a, a biography to give you some insight of the background and who influenced him. You know, who really was his shining light and what really spurred him to do some of the things that he did. Um, it's not too long, but it's detailed. And I know that most of y'all don't know this information. I know that. And my major concern always is when we're dealing with these personalities that we know who we're dealing with and understand what their background is, what their contribution is, and why we hold them in such high esteem. It's important to know that. We don't just do it romantically because everybody else is doing it. We're doing it because we know the value of these individuals. Now, yes sir? Uh, doing the interview, was that during the time period that he was losing his sight? That's correct. He was, he was actually at that time pretty much have already have lost his sight. You know, not, I would say completely, but he was in the stage that Doc Clark was just before, you know, Doc he, lost he his sight. Really That's correct. You hit it right on the nose. That means that he could move around and see certain things, shadows or things like that, but if it came down to reading, teleprompter, it wasn't going to happen. So he couldn't write, was he still in the process of writing books at that time? He was always writing books. As a matter of fact, this book, that book, the destruction was really was supposed to be two volumes. And uh, because of his sight, it ended up having to be scaled down to one volume. And then also financial reasons, as you know, in the beginning of that, uh, footage that Tony Brown talks about, he gives you some of that information in the in the um, beginning of the uh, the the interview. But um, most of the material that came out in regard to Chancellor was always limited in regard to detailed material about his background. And um, the only other individual that I know that did a little bit of background in that was uh, Kaba Kameen a.k.a. Booker T. Coleman, brilliant scholar, brilliant educator, brilliant teacher. He's just an all-around brother. And um, he wrote one book on Leo Hansberry, and I'm pretty sure he did Chancellor Williams. But I do know he gave a talk on Chancellor Williams before, too. So, you know, you probably can also be uh, 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 aware of that. Um, the material that I'm, again, I'm going to be drawing from I'm so old, I gotta get back. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna be drawing from is uh, this is a redone book, Chancellor Williams, the, um, the Rebirth of African Civilization. This um, particular copy, one of the things that, um, again, I'm always uh, a very stickler about, and that is, is about uh, black publishers and black um, uh, distributors and black retailers. You know, most people that know me know I'm a bookman and I've been in the book business. So I'm very familiar about the mechanics, the functional aspects of the book business and some of the major players. This particular book was done by Third World Press and the uh, Proprietor of that is Haki Manabuti. And he is probably foremost, there's only three major black publishers that are still in existence today and that come from those early days. And that's one, Haki Manabuti, Third World Press. Two, Paul Coates, the father of Tanahisi Coates, who actually is the owner and proprietor of Black Classic Press, which prints all Doc Ben books. And then you have African
African World Press. That's by Casa Holmes, an Ethiopian brilliant brother. Mostly does textbooks dealing with African, African material on every. As a matter of fact, this Tariq El Fatas, this is his material. This comes from African World Press. And then you also have African World Books. That's Natty, the brother that owns um, African World Books down in Baltimore, DC. Maryland. Huh? Isn't that DC? No, that's Maryland. He's from Pennsylvania Avenue down in Maryland. And he's a publisher, distributor, retailer, all the way across the board. And these are the individuals you want to, want to be aware of because they on the front end, front edge, uh, the cutting edge of being able to circulate and distribute this information. Um, again, this is from The Rebirth of African Civilization, Chancellor Williams, Third World Press. It was originally, originally published in 1961. It did a Third World re um, 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 a republishing edition that was done in 1967. This one that I have in my hand was done in 1993. And um, we will be reading from uh, da, 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 da. 52 one, seven. Okay. We'll be reading from the forward. Now this forward here is um, from the edition of the 1993 version. So in other words, this is not the foreword uh, uh, from the uh, 61 or the 67, you see. And like I was explaining to her, when you deal with the time periods in which books are written, we're talking about what information is available in that book that might not have been available in the first edition. And I was telling them about a book that I had by Peter Goldman. He wrote a book called Life and Death of Malcolm X. And in the first edition, uh, it was a regular book dealing with the history of Malcolm and the nation of Islam, so forth and so on. But he wrote a, sec he wrote a, a second edition to that in the, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the 60s or the 70s, but I'm, I, I can't get off the top of my head right now. But he wrote a second edition, and in that second edition, he put in the appendix, the, the uh, appendix of the book, he put in an affidavit that came from the uh, New York um, um, State. And in that affidavit, it was the five individuals that That's killed right. Malcolm. That's right. And uh, how he got that information was based on an event that took place at, um, at Attica. Because when Attica was taken over, Thomas Hare happened to be in Attica at the time, right. and the guy who was the negotiator for Attica was William Kunstler. That's right. The and William Kunstler was the individual who goes in there, and he finds out that Thomas Hare is one of the individuals who's holding down some of the Muslims in one of the wings. And Thomas Hare approaches Kunstler and asks him, look, you know, I need you to open up Malcolm X's case. And he said, what are you talking about? He said, uh, I'm telling you, you need to open up because I'm going to tell you who the killers are. And he said, well, who are you? He said, well, I was one of them. Wow. That's right. And then Kunstler goes to the state and finds out that he wants to try to open up the case. So they, they eventually shut it down. They won't open up the case. But the affidavit is available. So what Peter Goldman does is he take that affidavit and he put it in the book. So if I say, go get Peter Goldman's book, Life and Death of Malcolm, and you don't know what edition it is, you ain't going to get the juice. Mm -hmm. You get it? This is why dates play an important part in regard to certain kind of material. So you have to learn what I call, uh, what Professor Simmons used to call, the five you know, rules of etiquette about a book before you read it. So that way you understand what's going on before you jump in. Documentation. So again, this is from the forward, 1993 edition. And um, again, you know what? Yeah. All right. 
Chancellor Williams was born December 22, 1905, Bennettsville, South Carolina, the youngest of five children. His father was an ex-slave and his mother was a domestic. Young Williams finished the eighth grade in Marlboro County, South Carolina. Restless, frustrated, and dissatisfied, he left the segregated, quote, Jim Crow conditions of rural Bennettsville to advance his education in, quote, Jim Crow, Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> It said there he attended Dunbar and Armstrong High Schools. The decade of the 1920s were the Garvey years. Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association dominated the headlines. Undoubtedly, this had a remarkable influence on Williams' development. He entered Howard University in 1925. Let me say that again. He entered Howard University in 1925 and graduated with a BA degree from the School of Education in 1930. The start of the quote, Great Depression, unquote, while at Howard, Williams witnessed the struggles of Professor William Leo Hansberry. Let me say that again. While at Howard, Williams witnessed the struggles of Professor William Leo Hansberry, 1894 to 1965. Y'all know who Leo is, right? Absolutely. He the only one answered. Do y'all know who no. William is? Y'all ever heard of Lorraine Hansberry? Well, that's her uncle. I'm going to tell you this. This is another. I want you to write it down. Write this down. I want y'all to... Not, I don't want to know who Leo is. Y'all can find that out, and y'all going to be amazed at what you find. I want y'all to find out who the hell Lorraine Hansberry's father is. When y'all find out who he is, believe me, you're going to be floored. Mm. He, he was, was no joke. Hansberry was part of the Harlem History Club? That, the Clark, the Clark, the Clark, the uh, well, no, he wasn't a part of that, even though... All of those guys. He was Dr. Knew. Clark before Dr. Clark. Well, even before that, that, before that, because remember, the guys that he hung with, you know, James, I mean, um, Quarterman, um, John G. Jackson, Hubert Harrison, Surreal Briggs, all of these individuals, you know, they sat at the feet of those individuals that came before. So they's laying the foundation. And Chancellor, re remember, he's coming in on the tail end of those guys. You know, so Leo Hansberry is the man. But as I, as I speak, like I said, Kaba Kameen, Kaba Kameen, a.k.a. Booker T. Coleman wrote a book on William Leo Hansberry. It's an excellent piece of work. Y'all need to go check it out. It says that while at Howard, William witnessed the struggles of <laughs> Professor William Leo Hansberry, who was labeled, listen now, this is at Howard University. While at Howard, William witnessed the struggles of William, Professor William Leo Hansberry, who was labeled a troublemaker by blacks and whites for his persistent effort to make African history recognized and respected as a legitimate academic <coughs> discipline in Howard University. Wow. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. Howard University is named after General Oliver O. Howard, who was head of the Freedmen's Bureau, who also was a white joker who literally made it his business, made it his business to set up not Howard University for black people, but actually Howard University was set up for a buffer group that was the offspring That's of right. black slave plantation owners and field hands. That's why when you went to Howard University, you had to send a picture of yourself, and they had a brown paper bag mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They tell you that. What's his name? Uh, Claude Anderson, he wrote a book called Little Dirty Secrets. In that book, it tell you the story about that. But if you want to go into more detail, there's another brother, I can't remember his name, he wrote a book called Ebony and Ivy. And it's about Ivy League universities 
that built the universities on the back of slaves. He goes in detail. You know, Georgetown, Princeton, all of these, the, the ones that had the most slaves was the most religious. Y'all don't know that, right? Hmm. <laughs> hey, Amen. That's, that's how they was wrote it. It says that to make African history recognize a respected and legitimate academic discipline, Hansberry at the time had received his BA and MA degrees from Harvard University but was unable to study for his PhD degree because there were no universities or institutions that had manifested a really profound interest in the subject of African history. In other words, there was no PhD program in African history ever in America. Y'all do know that, right? Anybody know where was the first PhD program on African history in the United States of America? U University of Pennsylvania. No, sir. Temple? That's right. I'm in Temple. Now, you know, I know Pennsylvania. I know Pennsylvania. But that's all the rest of the kids. But so wait, we're also in Tristan. Yeah, but, that, but anyway, one thing we do know about is, uh, is Mike, Mike, we're going to give you that one because it was in Pennsylvania. Yes, right. We're going to give you that one. Right. And, but, and to this day, he's made right. more black PhDs than anybody. That's without a doubt. And the, the issue is, well, not anymore because he's not head of the program anymore. That's been defunct for quite a while. But the issue here is, is that it took a black man in a black university to produce a black PhD in African history. That's cool. That's just what I was getting ready to say. I'm down with that. <laughs> I'm down with that. I don't need no white boy need to tell me about my history and giving me awards for look, you in the NAACP, the highest award you can get is the spin guard award. True. I go smack that joke and like, what you, what's wrong with you? But you know why? Because we don't know that the NAACP was not a black organization anyway. It was set up by Mary White, Ovington, Villard, Garrison, and and Will and, and English, excuse me. No, four. Three white boys <laughs> and a woman. Mary White Ovington, anybody ever heard of her before? This white lady was off the chain. This is the only white woman. I, let me take it back. She's the only white person that I know. She wrote that wrote, wrote articles for the right. Negro World for right. Marcus Garvey right. newspaper. What's her name? Her name is Mary White Ovington. Mary White? Mary White. White. She was a right hand to, uh, she was good friends with uh, Margaret Sanger in there. Mm. Right. You got Margaret Sanger, mm. Hubert Harrison, um, um, what's her name? Mary White Ovington. All of them fought for women's rights in the 20s and the 10s. How you spell that shit? Ovington. O V I N, I mean, O V. I N G T O N. T O N. Just look at the look up the women's suffrage movement. Then. Right. Mm -hmm. She's part of that, that that experience. But let me move on. It says to today, the attack on defenders of African history and culture continues as advocates of African uh, centeredness are viewed by some as a fringe group that has invented a romantic and exotic history of black kings and queens who never existed. Williams, whose experience in this regard mirrored his mentor, Professor Hansberry. Whose mentor? Hmm. You get what I'm saying? In other words, now you're beginning to find out that the guy who was the major influence on Chancellor Williams was Leo. Mm -hmm. Leo was the guy who set the standards. It says that um, his, his mentor, Professor Hansberry, states, quote, My first study in African history was done at a time when to investigate the field was looked down on. The fact is that Howard wouldn't let Hansberry put Africa on the title of some of his work. Let me say that again. Howard University. Let me say this also. Trust is not against A B I mean HBCUs. 
believe that. But we have to tell the truth when it comes down to who we are and what our contribution is and what role those individuals play. I got a book at home called The Foundation of Medi the uh, Medicine Department at Howard University. Who created it, who set it up, and it's all white. All white, everyone in there is white. The only doctor or uh, the up and coming was a black was a black guy, but he was so light skinned in the pit you can't even tell that he's black. <laughs> no, I'm serious. This is this is where we was at, and this is not an issue of just t attacking black universities, but it's putting the proper um, um, information in place to show the level of evol evolving of what took place to where we are today versus where we came from. And when you say black universities, is it truly black? Claude Anderson said, well really, it was, at that time, it was a white university in blackface. That's what he said. And it wasn't hard to come up with that conclusion. And then when you look at it, name some universities that were truly owned, operated, supported, and financed by black people. It ain't a whole lot. Howard was it? Lincoln was it? Only one that I know that had that kind of juice was Mary and Cloud Bethune. She was the only one. Everybody else got money from somebody else. And one, of the, and one thing that you know, most of the institutions, whether they be civil, whether they be um, um, economic, or whether they be educational, that was financed by white people involving black people still exist today. Everyone that was done by black people does not exist. Mm -hmm. So when we think about Marcus Garvey, it does not exist. When we think about Booker T. Washington, it does exist. Mm -hmm. These are realities that we have to look at. And why certain institutions were able to thrive and other ones were pushed to the wayside. What really began to, I began to see this was when I was doing research on Hubert Harrison in the early days. And I was looking for articles out of the Negro world. Well, oh, shit, I'm in Harlem. I, shit, all I should be able to do is go right up to the Schomburg Library and just peel through all of the damn papers that they got. <coughs> so I go to the Schomburg um, with a Negro world newspaper. Negro world news? We don't have no Negro world newspapers. Wait a minute, this is Schomburg. Marcus <laughs> Garvey was in Harlem. All them years, shit, he damn dead. Before he died, he was here. Where's the paper? You know where they at? They at Harvard University. Mm -hmm. I had to go all the way to freaking Boston to see the damn newspapers. That's incredible. Why? Because most of the information, a great deal of time, the Schomburg wouldn't take them. Look at Hubert Harrison papers. Where they at? Columbia University. You wouldn't have a freaking Schomburg library if it wasn't for him. It was only two guys, him and and Alonzo Schomburg, and, and read anything about Alonzo, you say, well, without Harrison, I mean, like, what are we talking about? Why did it have it on microfilm or something like that? Again, you have certain things on microfilm, but you, back then you wasn't putting all that kind of material on microfilm. And not only that, you know, nowadays, I mean, believe me, I went crazy looking at microfilm. And um, let me just give you an added, um, before we go on, just to give you some added insight about microfilm. One day, I was looking for an article in 1921 about um, Hubert Harrison um, giving a speaking engagement down in the sub-treasury right underneath the office of J.P. Morgan. If you look out his window and Harrison be standing on the corner. And this particular day, Harrison uh, was on the corner and he was talking, he would talk about every kind of subject. He would talk about theater, he was a, he was a theater critic, he would talk about um, movies, he was a movie critic, he talked about, um, what do you call it, he talked about science, he talked about evolution, he talked about politics, I mean he, he was the first socialist, I mean all of that kind of stuff. So he's downstairs, he's making, he's, he's 
galvanizing people just coming from all over the place just to hear him. You know, he was so good at what he did that they would have people from Columbia University and all of these major universities, when they heard that he was going to be steep, uh, stepped out of speaking, they would come down, sit on the curb, and listen to him. These are professors from the university. This particular day, 1921, he galvanized 11,000 people wow. on a corner. Wow. 11,000. The police came out and they had to rope off the area. So I'm, I'm looking for this information in the New York Times, the New York Times article, and as I'm looking for it, the microfilm, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, and I happen, I happen to scroll one page past the page. Well, I see the page and then I scroll past the page. But what was funny was, as I scroll past, I see a title on the article that says, Garvey must go. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know? So, I turn back to the page and I look at it, and it's an article that was written in regard to A. Philip Randolph. And A. Philip Randolph was making this big issue about Marcus Garvey being a charlatan. Mm -hmm. And that he was just telling black people lies and all of that. And him and Chancellor Owens, they decided that they was going to go out and that they were going to, you know, tell the black people community that Marcus Garvey and them was just, you know, trying to slam and scam them. So, um, when this all jumped off, in the article it was talking about when Marcus Garvey uh, members found out that they was standing on the corner making these claims against Marcus Garvey, they went and stepped to him and like, yo, home. You know, y'all need to stop that. Y'all need to not talk about Mr. Garvey like that, you know. You know, somebody might, you know, something might happen. Like that. So, you know, um, A. Philip Randolph, he was, you know, he was a bold, bodacious brother, you know. I mean, if you ever seen him, he's a tall, got a voice like, you know, Barry White, you know. And, um, you know, very imposing kind of individual, not easily to intimidate, put right. it like that. Labor man. Right, very much labor man. You wouldn't have no car boy. That's right, that was him. But be it as it may, they stepped to him in regard to that, and they went while he was speaking. They came to the point and said, "Look, you need to stop. If you say something else about Mr. Garvey, I'm telling you, you need to leave that alone." So he kept on talking. He kept on talking. So they went home. They finally packed their stuff up and they went back to their particular headquarters because most of the organizations that were led by these prominent personalities, every one of them had a newspaper. So at that time, uh, uh, A. Phillips Randolph and Chandler Owens' newspaper was The Messenger. Mm -hmm. And um, and Marcus Garvey had The Negro World, and then you had uh, W.E.B. And, and The Crisis with the uh, NAACP, and it was just papers all over the place. If you ever want to find out, at that time it was over 800 black newspapers, 800. Now, if you want to find detail out, there's a book written by a gentleman by the name of Theodore Vincent. Theodore Vincent. And the name of the book is called Voices of the Black Nation. Voices of the Black Nation. And it deals with corresponding relationships between these personalities. Like Marcus Garvey is writing, you know, about uh, Booker T. Washington. Or W.E.B. Du Bois is writing about, you know, Marcus Garvey. Um, in these books, you find out real, para, I mean, real uh, unskewed information. Like um, he wrote, a, he also, this Theodore Vinson also wrote a book before that called Black Power and the Garvey Movement. And in it, because I'm telling you what was deep is that particular book. When I, you know, I read that book, and then. Um, I was reading, I was going back reading of the forward, the acknowledgments, and I was reading in the acknowledgments because I like to know who these guys were influenced by. I'm like, where you get this information from? So I look at it, and the guy where he got most of his legwork was from Dr. Jeffries. <laughs> so I'm down at the uh, African Day Parade in Newark, and I'm running to Dr. J, and I say, Doc. You know this guy, Theodore Vincent? He said, Theodore Vincent. He said, I know that name from somewhere. He said, I, I, I'm not familiar. So I said, see this book? He said, oh, yeah, I remember that book. He said, I said, well, the guy in the, who wrote it, he writes this big piece about you in the book about you helping him, 
you know, you know, for some material. He said, yeah, yeah, white boy, you know, <laughs> he wanted to know some material about such and such, and we, you know, gave him this, so and so and forth. So he was there, he was laughing about the material and this, that, and the other. But he said to me, he said, yeah, he, he wanted to make one thing, he do good work. That's what he said, he said, do good work. Mm -hmm. So in that particular material, Theodore Vinson writes about how the Oklahoma, I mean, how the Ost, I mean, the Tulsa, Oklahoma riots got started. And see, a lot of us got this idea about, you know, crop dusting planes and all of that. The only problem is there's no evidence that could be um, linked with the actual crop dusting planes and dropping bombs. Now. Was Tulsa, Oklahoma burnt to the ground? Yes. But it wasn't the way you think it was. The best book ever written on the subject is used for Tulsa, the Tulsa, Oklahoma Reparations Committee. And you know who read, who was the chairman of that committee? His name John Hope Franklin. Mm -hmm. You know who John Hope Franklin is? He's from there. That not only is from there, his father was the lawyer for all them people. That's right. That's right. And in that book, there's a book that was written. It's called Death in the Promised Land. Death in the Promised Land. And in that book, it's used as the core book for that particular research, that study that was done pertaining to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and reparations. And again, you can't get more premier in scholarship than John Hope. You know, I mean, in regard to the study. And if I'm assuming that he decided to say, well, I'm going to use this particular book versus J.J. Rollins' book, or I mean, J.J. Wilson's book, or somebody else's book, I'm assuming because somebody got it right. I mean, from a scholarship point of view. And the second thing, I just want to say this before we go any further, and that is there's a connection between there's a connection between John Hope Franklin and that guy that I told you was the baddest scholar that ever lived, George Washington Williams. There's a connection. Y'all will find out when you do research. I ain't gonna tell you something. You're gonna do research. It says that, let me go on. It says that my first study in African history was done at a time when to investigate the field was looked down on. The fact is that Howard wouldn't let Hansberry put Africa on the title of some of his works. They said that there was no such thing as African history. In 1931 and 32, as a Rosenworld Fellow, Williams studied the cooperative movement in the Western United States. He then entered the graduate department of Howard University in 1934. Under the influence of Professor Hansberry Williams and the new and growing young crop of intellectuals inflamed with the ideas of African redemption and a commitment to the, pri the primacy of Africa were inspired by the works of writer scholars J. A. Rogers, W. E. B. Du Bois, Carter G. Woodson. Explain something to you about the book business. Scarce is the books that are only scarce to a person because you don't know where to get them. See, if you don't know where to get them, they're scarce. Mm. But if I know where to get them, you, they, you, you could go on um, uh, Amazon and they might say, Irritated Genie is $100. Yeah. But it's $14.95, Holmes. Mm -hmm. And they print it in Chicago. Mm. The problem is, is that if Amazon don't have access to the publisher or distributor, they say it's rare because they can't get it. Their position is, if we can't get it, it must not be available. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way it happens. The reason that is is because, see, most people don't realize that Amazon, in the beginning, they was just a book company. And they actually wasn't a book company. In the book business, we call them the middleman. Because yes. they, they, they never had books and they never had warehouses. They were just individuals who had a database. And they could contact people who were retailers and connect them with, with, with um, individuals who were distributors or publishers and customers. And that's what they made their money by. 
And after a while, they got so big that they, be, I'm talking about, when I say got big, I'm not talking about warehouses and books and all, I'm talking about in regard to their database. It got so big that when you wanted to find something, one of the only source references was Amazon. See, if I'm, back in the day, if I wanted to find rare books, I really had to go on my, you know, my legs and go look to find out whether they was available. They had certain books, a certain bookshop that would only sell certain kind of books. So them rare ones, like I was telling that Dr. Clark used to talk about this place, Blackwells in London. And they would be top of the line. And you find these all over different places, you know, where literature is, like London, uh, United States, you know, places like that. But again, that's in the book business. But, um... What I was just getting ready to say is, is that we have to be a little bit more enthusiastic about wanting to know the material, too. Also, if they don't want you to read, they'll put the price up. No, nah, that ain't going to ever happen. That's not how it is. Book yesterday. Say that again? They will put the price up. No, that's not how it so, goes. What I'm saying what is, is that... 1968 FBI memo to close all black bookstores. Yeah, but that, they're not going to do that by putting up a book price because they don't, they're not in the position to determine what the price is. The author is the individual who determines that. He could charge a penny if he want to. All the issue is is that when you go to a project publisher, you, the object is you paying him to do a service for you. He's not coming to you telling you how and what you do. See, they have a thing now called on-demand printing. On-demand printing, and what that means is, is that you can get 50 books, like if you are an author, I can print 50 of these on demand. I can print 100 or 1,000, but when you have a perfect um, bound printing press, they don't print 50 books. The first run on any book is 5,000. Next run, 10,000. That's how they print. So you certain books a publisher wouldn't print because they know that shit. I ain't gonna sell that. Mm. If I print five thousand, if I sell two hundred, shit, I'm gonna get stuck. So that's why they have what is called, you know, um, over uh, uh, overstock and, uh, books that they overprint. These guys take the books back. Uh, a liquidation company buys them by the pallet. You just get a book, I mean a pallet, it's a full pallet and books stacked up this high. And you pay a flat price for them. There's no returns or anything, and you sell them as you want to. But when a book is published, you can price it any way you want to. On the back of a book, you see this here? It's called an ISBN number. That's an international standard book number. The only thing that reference to is that this book was printed in the United States at a particular time and you can reference it in this um, set of volumes called Books in Print. And it will tell you that whether this book here is in circulation or not. Now, as you know, this book was just reprinted. So if you go back, say, a year or two ago and looking for, I mean, not this particular a year or two ago, look for this book, say, five or ten years ago in Books in Print, it wouldn't be there because it didn't have no ISBN number and it wasn't in circulation, even though the book was, you know, in existence, you see. And then in the black book community, we used to, the, the, um, Professor Lewis would tell you, back in the um, um, 80s, shit, we was bootlegging books like it was uh, more to, you know, part of the game plan. <laughs> the first copy of Iceman Inheritance was a Xerox copy in all kind of ways. <laughs> I mean, we had people listen. When we wanted the information, we did everything we possibly was available to get it. So you had individuals who developed companies out of bootlegging books. You remember Curtis Alexander? Mm -hmm. Curtis made, and his son now is, his son is blown up. You know his son? His son is a poet now. And he's on NBC, ABC, all of them. I know him when he was this big. And I'm telling you, where they used to hang out? Harlem. We used to have the Black Book Fair and all that. You know, uh, Max Rodriguez and all them jokers, you know. Uh-huh. 
He, you know, they don't have it no more. You know, it's done. Yeah, black books are finished. They have very some. Did y'all know they don't even have a black bookstore in Harlem? That's a shame. That is a shame. But we're going to stop now because uh, uh, we got some. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a quick. Uh, Quick break right here, about 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to unmute everybody. If you want to donate anything to Brooklyn William Mackey's History Club and you got my number, you can cash at me. Or you can hit me through PayPal at papermate104 at yahoo.com via PayPal. I'll put it in the chat to help with the Brooklyn William Mackey Jr.'s History Club. Let me give yourself a big hand. I hope you enjoyed the refreshments. We're going to bring trust back. Too, as a Rosewall Fellow, Williams studied the cooperative movement in the Western United States. He then entered the graduate department of Howard University in 1934 under the influence of Leo Hansberry. Hold on. I read you that part. Okay, this part. I'm sorry. He was awarded in an MA in history in 1935 and wrote as his thesis, quote, the socioeconomic status of the free Negro in the District of Columbia, unquote. Upon graduation, he served two years, 1935 to 1937, as administrative principal of the Cheltenham School for Boys in Maryland. During World War II, Williams taught in the Washington, D.C. public school system and continued postgraduate study at the Universities of Chicago and Iowa. From 1941 to 1946, he held a series of positions in the federal government, section chief of the Census Bureau, statistician of the War Relocation Board, and economist in the Office of Price Administration. In 1943, Williams completed The Raven, a biological novel based on the life of Edgar Allan Poe. Let me say that again. This is 1943. That means his first book was The Raven, a novel. 1943. In 1946, he published a rather lengthy essay on race relations. Quote, and if I were white, that was the name of the essay. And if I were white, it was implied, it was replied to a lengthy essay on race relations, and, uh, on race relations. A group of white writers who wrote an article that he responded to called If I Were a Negro. In that same year, he joined the Howard University faculty in the Social Science Department. He completed his PhD in History and Sociology in 1949 at American University and entitled his doctorate dissertation, The Socioeconomic Significance of the Storefront Church Movement in the United States, 1920. Y'all think Skip Gate used that for his, for his documentary? What do you think about Skip Gates? Later, later, let us know, bro. It says the seeds of Chancellor Williams' pan Africanist philosophy developed and flowered in the atmosphere of the fifth pan African Congress as he witnessed President Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, and Nandi Ezekiwe, and others returned home to Africa to fight for liberation self-determination, and African unity. The impact of this conference on this, his thinking is best captured in this statement. Quote, we arrived with the idea that Africa needs westernization. We left believing nothing could be worse than complete westernization. Mm. By 1950, having taught American, European, and Arabic history, let me say that again. By 1950, having taught American history, European history, and Arabic history, Williams considered himself prepared 
for intense research on African beginnings. In reflecting on this transition, Williams remarked, quote, it was a good progression, a happy circumstance. Then I had a clear understanding of world history and the great European and American Africanists, not their point of view. In other words, what he is saying is, is that it's impossible, it's impossible for me to truly understand African history without world history because it doesn't operate in a vacuum. Now, the problem is, is that we can do that now from hindsight, but there is a period of time in human history where there were no white people. Anybody know how much time that was? A lot. 10,000. <laughs> he said 10,000. What'd you say? She said 6,000. 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, no, no, no. Thousands of years. Say that again. Thousands of years. 6 million. That's right. Actually, 6 million. No, 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 you mean, you mean how long? No, no, no. I got 1 million. I got 6 million. I got 1 million. How old is modern man? 200,000. How old is modern man? Modern man. Anywhere between 190, 250,000. That's moderate man. The word moderate means homo sapiens. Homo sapiens. Right. That's a side court people, right? Huh? <laughs> no, side court people. Well, Koisan, Koisan. Yeah, Koisan, and, and we're using those as a reference point. Right. Prior to that, you have everything that is of a human. Um, um, homo genre. erectus. Right. Say that again. Homo erectus. No, but homo is of what a particular line. Yeah. Another yeah. word. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is the white man a mutation of us, or is he an experimental other person that was made in the lab? Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of people would like to think that. Yeah, turn that white out. White people ain't know. Some people <laughs> said that he came from the Cedo, uh, no. the Cedo woman, and the and, 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 uh, uh, what no. per Wait, what, what person, what person, what person you trust? Wait, what person you know don't come from the Cedo woman? What uh, person? Oh, oh, listen, listen, listen. They say he came from the egg of a, the seed of a dog. In the egg of a woman. Yeah, but I'm asking you, what person in the world doesn't come from? I'm not saying I believe it. I'm just right. I'm doing it. I'm doing yeah, it. but I mean, yeah. rational tell me would tell you that. Come on, you know, give us a little more. What the that chicken and egg? Yeah. You, you, yeah, no, but he's talking about some nonsense that <coughs> Imam Isa put out there, or you know, the yeah. Islam. That's that's not science. Well, let's go. 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 Let
and the guy that you want to deal with is George Reisner. A. Reisner. George A. Reisner. And he was the big poobah at the time in Harvard because he also was the grim grand poobah at the University of Boston Museum of Fine Arts. He was the guy. Now, whether y'all know this or not, anything you know about Nubian history, 99% of it, he did the primary excavating research in those areas. And Boston Museum of Fine Arts were the ones that led the charge. So that's why me, Professor Simmons, and, um, and Brother X, we put a, a bus trip together. This was back in like 1987 or something like that from Brooklyn to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. We took two bus loads of individual and two van loads. We lived in blue and white people apart. They couldn't understand how many black people would come all the way from New York to see some black people in Boston. And not only that, because what they did was they had the Egyptian exhibit upstairs and they had the Nubian exhibit because it was new downstairs. Now mind you, they had all of this exhibit in their downstairs basement for over, you know, 50 years. And never showed it. Never showed one bit of it. And then now they were bringing it on to, on to display. So me and Professor Simmons, we got together. And what was really funny was when we got there, we had so many people, them white people, they was crazy. I'm talking about people who run the museum. Because at first they was like, oh, we don't know if we can give you a discount, this, that, and the other, and so. When they see all them people, that Joe came over to me and said, who? You, you the grand kid? He said, uh, come here. He said, uh, anything you want, man, you just let us know, you know. He said, uh, he said, you think you're coming back anytime soon? You know? <laughs> I was like, this is cracking now. All of a sudden, you gonna give me a hard time. Right. Now he's seen the money, the dollar signs, all of a sudden, everything's That's nice, awesome. you know. <laughs> but anyway, we get there, and um, George A. Reisner, tells, I mean, George A. Wright, I mean, uh, Leo Hanbury decides he wants to get this PhD. So he goes to sign in, uh, register at George A. Reisner's class, and he gets in the class. So he's sitting down in the class like so, and George A. Reisner is up there talking about Egyptian history and this, that, and the other. And at the conclusion of his small talk, he says that the Egyptians were white. So Leo Hanbury, uh, like, oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. So he raises his hand, you know, uh, Mr. Reisner, he said, yes, Mr. Uh, Hansberry, and he said, yeah, he said, uh, uh, I would like to uh, make a statement about that last statement you made, and he said, uh, and what is that? He said, you said that the, uh, that the Egyptians are white, and uh, he said, and, Hansberry, and uh, Reisner said, yeah, that's correct, he said, uh, but that's not what the history says. He said, what are you talking about? He said, well, Herodotus said that they had hair like wool and they uh, were black. And Reisner said, I don't care what uh, Herodotus said, I said they was white. And Leo said, well, he was there and he'd seen him. You didn't. I believe him. <laughs> so they threw him out the class. <laughs> so he decided that he was going to try to still get the... PhD, but they told him that the only place you can go now to try is go to England. Because that was the only place that had a PhD program that would be, you can get a doctorate's degree in African history. That was in Europe. You couldn't get one here. So he decided to go there. And he said that John G. Jackson said, oh, they were real nice to him in England. He said, when he decided to, to go up to residence, he said, oh, we don't give niggas degrees here. Oh. Just like that. Right. So he decided that he wasn't going to wait for them. He returned back to the United States and he decided to work to write a full history of Africa. And that's what he commenced to do. He wrote one volume and died. Mm -hmm. This is Leo Hansberry, the uncle of Lorraine Hansberry. He was the man. I mean, the man. But let me go on. I got a page here. It says that. Um, that now, it says that I withdrew from teaching on the formal course studies in African history at the University of Oxford and the University of London. It was important to know what the white world thought and thinks of the black world. I already, uh, I already knew what the white American thinks. This was in 1953, 1953. The rebirth, let me say this again, the rebirth of African civilization 
is Dr. Williams' account of his 1950 to 1957 research study of Europe and African education. During the 1950s, William wrote essay, additional essays, articles, and pamphlets that had profound impact on the field of history and education. He published The Rebirth of African Civilization in 1961, following his first field study in Ghana. Also, Williams wrote an important prophetic essay called, quote, Pan Asia, Pan, listen to this now, Pan Asiatic and Pan African Movements, unquote, for a 1961 edition of In Contemporary Ideologies. In 1963, Dr. Williams conducted his second field study in Africa, covering 25 countries and 105 different languages. His main objective was to document the independent achievements of the African race and the nature of black civilizations before the coming of the Asiatics and Europeans. The fruits of Williams' second field study was the publication in 1971 of the destruction of black civilization, Great Issues of a Race from 4500 BC to 2000 AD. So how many years was it between rebirth and destruction? Let me read it again. Let me read it again. It said, listen to this, it said that he published The Rebirth of African Civilization in 1961, following his first field study in Ghana. Also, Williams wrote an important prophetic essay, Pan-Asiatic and Pan-African Movements, for a 1961 edition in Contemporary Ideas. And then it said in 1963, 1963, Dr. Williams conducted his second field study in Africa, covering 25 countries and 105 different languages. His main objective was to document the independent achievements of the African race and the nature of black civilizations before the coming of the Asiatics and Europeans. The fruits, let me say this again, the fruits of Williams' second field study was the publication in 1971 of Destruction of Black Civilization. Ten years. Now think about that. The book that we are familiar with is what? This book. But this book came first 10 years before this. 10 years before this. And 99% of y'all never read it. And this sets the foundation for this. You can't destroy a civilization if you don't know it exists first. Let me go on. It said that um, the fruits of William's second field study was the publication in 1971 of Destruction of Black Civilization, Great Issues of a Race from 4500 BC to 2000 AD. Later, in 1979, Williams published another novel, another, The Second Agreement with Hell. That's the name of it, The Second Agreement with Hell. Shit, when y'all get out here, y'all be uh, Chancellor Williams scholars, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Second, Agreement with Hell. That's his third novel. Now, mind you, it shows you just out of what we read that he has already written more novels than he written nonfiction. But we are not familiar with that. One of the things that you talk about in regard to scholarship is how well a scholar writes. You know? So if you read Dr. Clark, you know he's a writer. You know that he doesn't just write academic. He's a poet. He's a literary individual. You can tell that by the way he writes. And many individuals who have those backgrounds, you can tell it in their writing. Other individuals are more cumbersome. Dr. Ben is more cumbersome. He ain't worried about using the correct word. His position is 
You got to get it. You got to get it now. And this is it. Okay. We, we, we run it down to the last minutes. It says that um, during this year, he was awarded the 21st Century Foundation, Clarence L. Halt International Biennial Prize for his, his significance and lasting contribution to black heritage. From Hansberry's African Studies Battles at Howard University during the 1930s through the black studies struggles of the 1960s to the present day African-centered movements of the 1990s, Chancellor Williams' vision of the importance of Africa and, uh, to African people has been consistent, clearly articulated, and well documented. Therefore, it comes as no surprise in the midst of today's pan-Africanist renaissance, the rebirth of African civilization being reissued to join the rightful place alongside Williams's widely read and discussed The Destruction of Black Civilization. The rebirth of African civilization is one more vital weapon in our intellectual arsenal. Again, it is time to announce Williams's quote, call for greatness and the need for a master plan, unquote. Africa's greatest age could be the 21st century as we observe the surgeon, the resurgence, excuse me, of the idea of, quote, Africa for the Africans coming from a number of young people in America, the Caribbean and the continent of Africa. We are now witnessing new generations continuing the struggle for African liberation. The decade of the 1990s promises to be the decade of truth and the awakening of the African sleeping giant from the four centuries of the most oppressive conditions faced by any race on this earth. The rebirth of African civilization provides the serious minded who seek participation in the reawakening with a program of action unbound by the values and goals of Western civilization. This forward was written in 1993 edition by Anderson Thompson, Center for Inner City Studies, Northeastern University, Chicago, Illinois. Northeastern University is a college that Haki Madhubuti uh, taught in. So I'm assuming that what he did was got one of his colleagues to write the forward for this particular, uh, this particular volume. I thought it was an excellent, you know, um, small biography. It gives you some detailed material about um, Chancellor Williams, his um, educational background, some of his areas of activism, some of his, um, um, I, I look at um, areas of literary, you know, accomplishments, but most of all, you know, um, being one of those pioneers, navigating, you know, the intellectual uh, halls of academia and literally, you know, uh, cutting these jokers down, you know, at the knees. And uh, you can't be but, you know, uh, grateful to a person of that caliber that took his whole life to do this. A lot of these books, he damn near lost his, his house mm. trying to get them written. Wow. Mm. People took advantage of him mm. in so many ways. Look, him died in the nursing home. Doc Ben, Dr. Clark, um, John G. Jackson. I mean, Dr. Lewis would tell you, we need to be a little bit more responsible about taking care of our particular heroes and heroes. We need to stop all of this. Y'all give freaking Michael Jordan all your damn money and don't take care, you know, Adelaide Sanford. Mm -hmm. She right here. Right here. Right, right here. You know what I'm saying? She's still teaching. Right, and we ain't giving up a dime. And then what's going to happen? We're going to all cry boo tears when she died or what she did while we was there and could have contributed and didn't do nothing. I'm glad you still teach. Well, listen, one of the things that I can say, knock on wood, 
thank God for people like Professor Simmons and and Doc Band and Dr. Clark because I didn't I, I didn't go to lectures. I went to study. And Professor Simmons was very adamant about providing you outlets for research and study. All of our study groups and classes we have are not about books. They're about research and study. The mechanics of research and study. How to study. How to interpret. How to dissect. How to literally read a damn dictionary. Read a dictionary. I didn't say look up a word. I said read a dictionary. Open it up, forward, look at the introduction, and read the damn thing. Because most of us don't know how to use a dictionary. We think using a dictionary is looking up a word. That's not how you use a dictionary. If, you, if I ask you how to use a dictionary and you tell me that you do, and I ask you a word, that means that all you did was not just read the damn one page, two pages in the front of the book. So if you tell me that you understand how to use a dictionary and you don't know what a diacritical is, how are you going to pronounce the word? Because a diacritical ain't nothing but an accent over a letter to determine the pronunciation of the word, of the vowel, or of the particular letter. That's just basic. So when we, how many um, children go to a class and learn how to use a dictionary? They think you're supposed to know. I had a guy who was getting his master's degree come to my study group. I asked him about a dictionary. Oh man, I know how to use a dictionary. I asked him about it, he ain't know nothing. I said, you getting a master's degree, but you can't even look up a dictionary. But you, you know, you telling me that, you know, you better at this than me. I ain't mad shit. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> all I know, like, like Dr. J said, you spend all that money on that, you know, Oxford, you know, education, and they ain't give you shit, you know? But let me go. I just wanted to end here by letting you know one thing, and that is, real education is tedious. And time consuming. And you ain't gonna get it overnight. And the most important thing about it is, is that if you want to find the real conclusions, you got to do the work. How, how more do you want to go? Uh, I mean, that's up to you. No, it's up to you. Okay. You said 9.30. How much more do you want to go? Okay, another 15, 20 minutes? Okay. okay. Well, the thing again here is, is that we have to begin to realize the significance of the roles these personalities play. Now, the reason, I just want to bring to your attention the reason why I brought this book this book and this book. Now, there is some material, you know, that um, Chancellor Williams wrote. You know, Chancellor Williams also was a controversial writer. And Chancellor Williams, like Dr. Clark, had a, a, a bone to pick with particular groups, you know. So if you know Chancellor Williams, if you know Dr. Clark and I say Islam, you know. It was a little issue. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I no, it's a little issue. No doubt. Right. No doubt. But um, you, if you read deep enough, you'll find out that there was an issue with Chancellor Williams, too. And Chancellor Williams is a little different than uh, Dr. Clark in that area because Chancellor Williams used to actually teach Arabic history and teach European history. That was his cup of tea. And, um, um, whether you know or not, there's a lot of individuals that went after him. I'm talking about the Muslim community. And this was in, you know, late 70s, early 80s, you know, kind of situation in regard to, um, you know, attacking him and some of his scholarship because he took a position about um, Islam. But he made a statement, and that was in regard to, and I'm pretty sure all of us talk about excuse me, the Arab invasion, the Arab invasion of Africa. Y'all never heard of it? Right. Sure. Right. Right. Now, but there's a scholar, his name is Abu Malal. He, he's a very, excuse me.
skilled and very well-read individual. And um, he made a statement in regard to a position Chancellor Williams had made about um, Arabs um, invading Africa. And he says it didn't happen. And his source, his source for it was Shakanta. Shakanta is not only African, but he grew up as a Muslim. Now, if you read any of Shakanta, let me just say this. Unless you get to a point of scholarship and understand details of concepts and ideologies, a lot of times you will read material and it's just like over your head, so you just read it and you just keep going. You know, but there's a point where that you have to really take your time and sit down to really begin to absorb the material. And some of us are not really um, skilled to take time to do those particular things. So in that book over there, The Story of Truth, by uh, 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 Ajikun, a good friend of mine, um, when it comes down to science and uh, intellectual scholarship, he is one of these kind of guys. He's a teacher right here from Brooklyn. But he's very well read in, you know, science and uh, the mechanics of research and study and so forth and so on. But be it as it may, when he began to read some material about Shakyam Tadiyah, as a matter of fact, he did some issues pertaining to the two cradle theory and began to attack it based on particular shortcomings. Now, the issue is, is that don't be, you know, surprised that you can't attack one of our scholars. Yes, you can. And you can attack anybody who falls short. It's not an issue of being mean-spirited attack. It's attacking it in regard to its error. Stop looking at it like it's a fight. It's not. It's about scholarship. And in the academy, that's going to be part of the process anyway. So if you're a scientist and you invented something of significant value, Dr. Lewis said it's going to have to go to scrutiny. So it goes to white papers and all of these different type of, you know, um, critical colleague analysis in order to literally feed, uh, meet the test. And some do, some don't. But that's the idea of it. So when you get these journals, Nature, you know, this, uh, Discovery, all of these different scientific journals, the, you know, um, um, what's the, the, um, the, um, the uh, medical one, Dr. Lewis, M, um, Manson? Yeah, not Manson. New England Journal of Medicine? Yeah, New England Journal of Medicine. These particular journals are not writing for y'all. They're writing for the, the, the medical community. And the issue is, is that they know that people who are skilled in that area, sometimes in our community, we do things and there's no body to um, checks and balances. Critique. That's right. And when the critique is done, a great deal of time is done from an outsider with a mean-spirited approach, which is not the way it should be done. When we're doing research and study, research and study, there is no wrong. In science, there's not, they don't use the word wrong. They use error. Because they use that as a, a trial and, 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 a, and, and a process that they ruled out. Because this does not provide us any satisfaction for what we need to get done. So we, out, we rule that out. It's not an issue of wrong. It's an error of trying to be right. But that's not how we look at the information. What, what was the conclusion that uh, Diab came to about there was no Arab invasion? I'll give it to you. Hold on. Okay. I think I better start here. Much has been made. This is, excuse me. Almost messed up. Pre-colonial Black Africa, Shakan Tibia. This particular was done by Lawrence Hill Publication. It was originally done in 1987. And uh, I, 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 I'm almost sure that 
This was done before. Put your glasses on. This was done before. Yeah, you're right. Put your, <laughs> this was done before '87, but this was done in an English version. And the reason that is because most of Shock's material was done in French first. So um, that's where you would uh, see most of that. Okay, now. Uh, it says that uh, much has been made of Arab invasions of Africa. They occurred in North, but in Black Africa, they are figments of the imagination. Y'all heard that? Mm -hmm. Let me say it again. It says that much has been made of Arab invasions of Africa. They occurred in the north. Anybody uh, familiar with what he is talking about? They occurred in the north? No, they Egypt. Yeah. Egypt, Algeria. Morocco. Morocco. Yeah. Well, you, you did point out that he's Muslim. That's correct. Okay, all right. Right. Well, you now, know, and I know you ain't going to point out that he's married to a white woman, but that's <laughs> not <laughs> <laughs> Now, the, 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 yeah, but the issue here is, is again, we, as much as Islam and his white counterpart, um, the, the issue here is um, the accuracy of the scholarship. That's what we're looking at. This is not about opinion. This is not how you feel about Chop or how you feel about Chancellor. This is about information and getting it right. And what is being said here is based on evidence. Now, because one thing you have got to bet your bottom dollar. Shock is not making a statement shooting from the hip. That's not his MO. He don't ever go down that road unless he has some evidence to support the claim. Because in his, in his, um, in his uh, um, African origins of civilization, myth, or reality, there's a, there's a, a reference that's made, and it's given in the uh, in the uh, footnotes, and he makes a reference that how white people came was that black people um, intermarried with Asians and they made white people. This is what Shot said. Now, mind you, again, you have to take into consideration well, African origins of myth or reality. When was that book written? And what science was available to him at that time in order to come to that kind of conclusion when he's a physicist? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So the situation has a lot to do with, again, understanding time and place and information and how that plays into a position that a scholar takes about something. Because if he has already a history of being, you know, um, um, shady or, you know, lackadaisical about certain things, then you have understand it. But if he got uh, a track record of being consistent, crossing T's and dotting I's and having evidence, and you got to give him a certain amount of credit. If he say something, the first thing you're going to be doing is looking for where he got it from, you know? Brother, trust you right. However, they are exceptions, and then they are great exceptions. That's correct. And some people not only have a double consciousness, some people have a triple consciousness. Yeah, some people and, have a And quadruple. with all the good they've done, mm -hmm. you can look and see just how sick they are based on who they sleep with mm -hmm. and who orientated them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even the great ones, whether well, it's Fred Douglas, and so many others. Or anybody. So, it, yeah, so many about others. And in that particular that. case, he cannot right. say that this is somehow mass hysteria that we imagine mm -hmm. invasion by Arabs. Right. That's ridiculous. Well, let's wait a minute. Let's read and see what we got. Whoa. It says, while the Arabs did, it says, while the Arabs did conquer north by force of arms, they quite peacefully entered black Africa. The desert always severe as a protective as a protective shield. From the time of the initial Umayyad setbacks in the eighth century, no Arab army ever crossed the Sahara. Now me, y'all know me if I may, may I say one thing. No, one thing you gotta realize 
How old is the average? Oh, you better let him answer that question, brother. Let him answer that question first. Trust me, continue. Listen, now, one of the things that I know for sure is, is that, as I told you earlier, it's where you get your information to make a claim. And as we begin to read, you'll see that the source material in regard to the claims that are being made are not his own. They come from source material. You know his source material is? <laughs> this is his source material. The problem is, did Chancellor Williams read it? Well, one thing we know for sure is, is that up until recently, and I'm saying in the last year or two, it was never in English. It was only in French, and it was only in Arabic. Now, to me, to me, it would be hard to be a university scholar in Arab history. Yeah, we've got to cut it down. University scholar in Arab history if you didn't read no Arabic at all. You would have to have some, at least some, you know. But in order to read this in its original, you would have to read it in Arabic. But now we're talking again in regard to a particular period of time. Now, me, I read some of this material and read some of the already, I mean, the, the translated material and some material that was read by some of them scholars I tell you all about, Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Battuta, Al Omari, all of them, because they lived at that time. And all of the stories that they told, these are all of the individuals, told the story of how Muslims came into certain areas and then eventually took over. And especially in areas like um, um, Central, Central and Southern West Africa, and then Central and Southern East Africa. And what we're saying is, is that, like, let's take, um, you know, Ghana uh, Empire, which was the first. How did it fall? Anybody know? Got an idea? Well, it fell because, remember, one of the key factors was that guy, Askia Muhammad, wasn't Askia. They came and they converted the king. How did the fight take place? Because half the kingdom, listen to this, half the kingdom decided to convert and the other ones didn't. The king didn't make a big deal about it. But what happened is that the surrounding regional tribes got pissed. And they decided to go to war. And it wasn't with outsiders, it was internal. So if you read the histories of Ghana, Sangai, and Mali, 99% of what takes place are internal issues with kings taking over other kings and, you know, so forth and so on. You know, trust quickly, you know, in the last few years, you know, years ago, okay, let's say in the last 20 years, 30 mm -hmm. years, there have been a lot of arguments about places like Darfur and other places. That's correct. Where you have mineral wealth mm -hmm. under the ground mm -hmm. that's going to be taken out of the ground and who's going to control it. Mm -hmm. And Arabs will finance sometimes other blacks to kill other blacks and sometimes... But that's what they always do and that's why right. black people do the same thing. The issue is... But I'm just saying it creates arguments and you will find Muslims that are black defending them yeah, but by they, saying... But, but they have a vested interest. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like um, Khalid Muhammad and Malcolm talking about Elijah. If, if no matter how bad no matter how bad Farrakhan treated Khalid Muhammad, no matter how bad he did, if, if Farrakhan said, come, my son, be next to me, he'd have jumped up, yes, sir. left you hanging on the corner, and he'd have been in that mix like a bad dream you'd have been up in there. True. Really? And I'm True. saying the same, no, the same, the same thing would have been for Malcolm yes. because they were more That's vested right. in the That's personality right. Right. than the principle. That's, right. That's all I'm telling you. I'm just basing on based on what the evidence. So this is not Truss's opinion. I'm just basing it based on what the evidence shows. This is in fact to 
Just recently, they're telling you, and I talked to someone earlier about the issue about this new information. That ain't no damn new information. Right. Uh -huh. Police, NYPD, and the FBI. Yeah, this but guy just died on his bed, and he's like, yeah. Yeah, but that anybody happened. who did research knew that shit. Listen, y'all want some new information? Listen, if y'all don't ever do nothing, buy the damn book and read it. And if it take you a year, do it. I don't care. Take your time. Listen, I'm serious. Take your time. Read the material. But I guarantee you this. If you read this, if you read this, you're going to take the autobiography and throw it away in the book pile. I'm not saying that it's a bad book. But this here is on a whole nother level. When we talk radical, this radical. Straight up. This is the, and, the, and his, his right-hand partner was a woman with two pistols smacking a gun named Ida B. Wells. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 At the top of her hat, she was at the drop of her hat. Right. That's right. That's right. Both of right. them were part of the Niagara movement mm -hmm. when W.E.B. Du Bois was leading the organization at the time. White folks were so, so upset, they decided to draft, to draft W.E.B. Du Bois into the NAACP. Right. People running around talking about he was a founding member, and he really wasn't. He was, like I told you, four white people, and then they went and got him to be part of it. Go read the story. The guy who actually set up the organization was English because he was in the Springfield riots in Illinois when they was killing black people. That's right. And he went all the way back to New York, had a meeting with Mary White up at them and said, we got to deal with this. And they created an organization, him and three other individuals, one happened to be a preacher all of them, and not one of them was black. Remember, Villard was the, and Garrison, these were already sons and grandsons of abolitionists. So they had a lot of this in their background. But the issue was they didn't have a black mouthpiece. And they knew that W.E.B. Du Bois was the most articulate, intellectual, and most uh, uh, listened to individual in the community. Right. So they decided to draft him. And what he did was he went to Monroe and he went to Ida B. Wells and said, look, come on, let's go down there. And Ida B. said, I ain't joining no organization that white people have. That's, 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 that's right. right.